where does this decision of discovering God's individual will take place? Yeah, it takes place in your heart because that's the place where the peace and the comfort comes to. We also speak of doing God's will as doing our heart's desire. Lean not on your own understanding. Trust in God and just trust him with all of your heart. Now, play with this for just a second. Anybody ever found the one in their heart? Did you also then find the 21st one and the 101st one and the 97,000th one? Every time this new person came along, your heart just kept telling you, this is the one. How in the world do I figure that out then? What do I do when that's all going crazy? We really make decisions this way? When does God reveal this will? Well, when did he reveal his moral will? Peter tells us that he revealed himself in the past through the prophets. When is he revealing his individual will? It's a constant ongoing in the present. Which means don't get too comfortable because this may only be a stop in God's will. You never know what the next step will be. Which means even when you think you've discovered God's will for the moment, what do you have to start doing now? What's God's will for tomorrow's big decision? And the day after that, the day after that, the day after that. And then who does God reveal this will to? His moral will? Who has access to the Bible? Everyone where it is located and everyone where missionaries continue to ruin people's lives by revealing to them what God calls them to do. Also, by the way, also offering them the opportunity of salvation, which they also greatly and desperately need. But when God reveals his individual will, who does he reveal that to? He reveals that to the individual. How does he do that? Well, let's look at examples from biblical texts that are used to show how God does this. Genesis chapter 24, verse 12 through 14, is the great moment where Eleazar, the servant of Damascus, who thinks he's got God's perfect will planned for his life, it's very simple. He is the great servant of Abram, then Abraham, this great and mighty ruler guy who's taken over a lot of property and accumulating great wealth. And here's the best part if you're Eliezer. There's no kids in the house, which means, based on the way inheritance works, Alfred the butler here is going to get to take over all of Wayne Manor when Abraham is done, all right? And then God comes in and messes up Eliezer's life because now there's a kid named Isaac and when we get to chapter 24 it's like God is just making life even tougher for Eliezer because Eliezer's on a mission now not about God's individual will for his life but God's individual will for the life of Isaac because he's been sent by Abraham to go find his son the one he's been sent by God to find the one and how does Eliezer go about doing that Great spiritual principle here, verse 12. The first thing he does is he pray. I think that's a great way. If God is talking to us and revealing himself, then prayer is going to be very important in this process. O oh Lord God of my master Abraham, give me success today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I'm standing beside this spring and the daughter of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a girl, please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And she says, drink, and I'll water your camels too. Let, th let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to who? My master, to Abraham, to Isaac. What's he looking for? He's looking for a sign. But he knows that you don't just go looking for any sign. You ask God to give you a sign. 
So we're trying to make decisions. We begin to ask God to show us what he wishes for us to do. Anybody ever done that? God, if this La Rosa's pizza is really good, then clearly Cincinnati, Ohio is the place you want me to live. Oh, wait, there's Skyline here too? Oh, the Reds are down the street? The school accepted me and gave me a scholarship? See, those were all signs. But the pizza and the chili were really good too. This idea of signs isn't just that, because sometimes we don't want to tell God to do exactly what we ask him to do. We want God just to, we want to give God the opportunity to show himself. Anybody know what this is often called? It's called laying out a, it's called laying out our fleece before God. Well, that's an odd phrase. Why in the world are we talking about fleece? Well, because it's a biblical principle, maybe, which we find in the book of Judges. Gideon is called to command the army of God. God tells him exactly what he's supposed to do. That's chapter 5. In chapter 6, we see this moment. At the very end of chapter 6, verse 36, God, Gideon said to God, if you'll save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look, I'll place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there's dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand as you said. And that's what happened. Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. Now, a bowl full of water is a lot of water from dew to be found in a fleece. But anybody see a problem with this as a sign? You ever gone out on a morning where it was dewy, but now the grass is dry, but you left something in the yard? What happens to the thing that's still out in the yard? oftentimes you're still wiping off dew Gideon figures out wait a minute I asked the dumb question I asked for a sign that isn't even a sign I mean obviously La Rosa's pizza being good is a is an unbelievable sign we all know that's going to be good and the fact that Skyline Chili is found in Cincinnati well duh that's the home of Skyline Chili that's a bad way to ask God to prove what he wants you to do what if you do the exact opposite Although I would never pray for God to make La Rosa's taste bad. So in verse 39, then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me. Why? Because I'm bugging you again. Let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece. This time, make the fleece dry and the ground covered with dew. That night, God did so. Only the fleece was dry and all the ground was wet. See, we start to try to figure out, it's not just finding signs, then we've got to make sure we're interpreting the signs correctly. And this is generally the part where it takes forever to make that decision. Well, I thought that was a sign, but was that really a sign? I'm not sure if it's a sign. Don't want to be presumptuous. If God's given me a sign, I've got to make sure this is the real sign. I did counseling one time. One time. No. Um, Joke for the three of you who realize I'm not a very good counselor. That's good. But I had someone come to me and say, you know, we got an opportunity to take on this, all, this option. And I said, would it benefit you personally? Would it benefit your family? And is there anything immoral about doing it? No, but I just don't know if this is what God wants me to do. I think you have freedom here. I think the signs, if you want to look that way, were pointing towards this decision. The person went and talked to another minister, because let's face it, I'm, you know, I was a wet behind the ear kid, they, he said. The older wise minister said, are you ready? Is this good for your family? Is it something you want to do? Is the opportunity available to you? Is it immoral? I think you have the opportunity to make this decision. Should have been what? Based on this idea. The signs are starting to point together because we did not consult one another didn't even know that either one of us had been consulted so there's a sign that God's clearly doing something maybe he didn't take the job so I assume that maybe God wasn't speaking so how do we do this we're looking for signs the signs seem to say let me be honest with you what I'm about to do is destroy this target and free you to a different style of living. 